Um, hello, everybody. Welcome to our next session of the PML Reading Group. Um, this week, we are going to be covering Chapter 7 on Linear Algebra, which will be presented by Anton Solitsky. So, um, Anton, um, you can start whenever you're ready. Okay, Hello, everybody. Which on my screen. Okay. I just finished slides today. And so open. Chapter seven. <clears throat> so today um, we will cover chapter seven which is very basic chapter on the first glance, but it has very important formulas for universal matrices, for block matrices. And uh, of course, I will not um, cover <laughs> the definitions of matrices and multiplication, I decided to start uh, a second, I will enlarge my presentation. I will start from the definition of linear transforms. So, and linear transforms uh, transform linear spaces. And so the definition of linear space is the follows. B is a linear space over field K. Um, if you are not familiar with fields, you can just think about real numbers R or complex numbers C. Um, in, in this space, there are, there are two operations. One operation denoted by plus, it's a binary operation and it um, satisfies these four properties. The um, commutative property, the associative property, the existence of unit element, which is zero in case of vector space, and inverse elements such that uh, x plus inverse gives the unit element. And the second operation uh, is defined on the product of this field. You can think about real numbers and this linear space V. So in my notation, Greek letters are the elements of the field. And 
two more properties, uh, five and six should be satisfied. The existence, um, the unity property and associative. And the two last properties are combination are combinations of these two operations and uh, these are distributive properties with respect to uh, elements of field and with respect to um, elements of vector space v um, now we will need the notion of dimension of our space, of basis, and rank. Um, so The rank of n vectors is defined as the number, I'm sorry, I didn't clean my right, <laughs> the um, number of this subspace um, maximal linear independent subsystem um, um, of this um, uh, linear um, envelope of vectors x. And what does it mean, um, maximal linear independent subsystem? Um, we can represent our vector x using some other vectors like e1, e2, and so en um, in and uh, we want to find the uh, minimal number of vectors uh, such that we can represent any vector in our space v via these vectors and uh, so this system is um, uh, maximal linear, linearly independent sub subsystem of vectors. Um, there is a useful theorem that um, if each vector of our space can be represented via vectors E and at the same time, it can be represented via M -M vectors F. Then um, um, and also E are linearly independent. Then uh, the number of these vectors E can't be greater than the number of vectors M. And uh, dimension. There are two possibilities. Uh, For any number n, uh, we can find a linearly independent system. Then the space is uh, said to be infinite dimensional. And th the other option is that we can find uh, n linearly independent vectors and any na larger number of vectors are linearly dependent. In this case, 
um, n is the dimension of the space uh, v. And uh, the last definition, any n linearly independent vectors of n-dimensional space are called basis of this space. Uh, let's introduce coordinate representation of vectors. Uh, assume that E is our basis in linear space V. By definition of basis, any vector of X can be represented as the linear combination of this vectors E with some elements of our field, or we can say with some constants, alpha. And these constants are called coordinates of vector X in this basis E. Let's we have an, another basis E prime. And um, each vector E prime um, is, has representation via the old basis E with these constants. Then the matrix um, composed of the columns, you can see that the indexes here corresponds to the columns A11, A21, which means second row, first column, and so on. So the matrix composed of these columns is the transformation matrix. And formula three um, represents the connection of the coordinates of vector X and old and new basis. If we want to find coordinates of x prime, we should just multiply by inverse a. And later we will know that uh, inverse is the same as transform in case of orthonormal basis. Okay, also we will need the notion of linear matrix. So assume now we have only finite dimensional spaces, uh, linear spaces, V and W. V has dimension N and W, uh, here is a misprint, should be W, has dimension M. Over the field K, now it's not important which is, what is the field k the mapping f from v to w is said to be linear if these two um, properties are satisfied so the mapping of the sum is the sum of mappings and um, the mapping of multiplication by the constant is the same as constant multiplied by um, the mapping. But it's important to note here that um, multiplication in this case um, I would say the field in this case can be different from the field of the original space. For example, it could be um, real space v, v, but here we can have, for example, complex numbers. Um, the set of um, the class of all uh, linear mappings from the space V to the space W is denoted uh, by L calligraphical linear or homomorphism from V to W. 
And um, this class of linear mappings, in its turn, is also a linear space uh, because of this um, equality. Also, um, there is a very important case, the mapping, the linear mapping from linear space V to the, our field K, or you can think about real numbers. In this case, this mapping is um, called linear form or also linear functional. I avoid to use the um, term function because linear function has also bias term, but linear mapping doesn't have this bias term. So I will use words like mapping transforms functionals and um, forms, linear forms. Okay. Uh, the next definition is isomorphism. So if there is linear uh, mapping between two linear spaces V and W. And this transform is bijective. That means one to one. Then this space V and W are said to be isomorphic. And there is theorem that all n dimensional linear spaces over the same field, K, are uh, isomorphic. And they're isomorphic to um, K N, or if it's real field, to R N. There are two important um, definitions uh, for linear ratings the kernel and image. So the kernel is the subset of V space and image is the subset of W space. The kernel is um, the set of all vectors uh, which our transformation maps to zero. And image is, is just image. <laughs> so it's just F of V or um, also we can write, it's the set of all vectors in W such that they have pre-image. And there's theorem, um, about the dimensions of kernel and image. So it says that um, for a finite dimensional space V, the dimension of V is the sum of dimension of kernel and dimension of image. But it's uh, important to note here that it doesn't mean that V can be represented as a sum of kernel F and image F. Um, well, if, if W is equal to V, which is the next topic, but in that case, kernel and image will be from the same space. And uh, it doesn't mean that V is the sum of kernel and image. Um, well, 
sometimes you can hear um, the words direct sum. What is the direct sum of the spaces? Um, in general, the dimension of the sum of two subspaces, I, I assume here that U and W are the spaces of the same larger space V, for example. And the dimension of the sum is the sum of dimensions minus the sum of um, intersection. But if any vector U can be represented as a sum of M vectors U and each vector U I belongs to a subset U capital I. And this representation is unique. Then uh, we can uh, speak about direct sum. So in this case, U is the sum of these subspaces U I. But with, instead of um, plus between spaces, we use this plus in the circle, which means in the case, for example, of two subspaces, that intersection of these subspaces is empty. And formula for dimension then simplifies as well without the last term. Okay, let's also mention matrix of linear mapping. So assume that we have basis V and in our space V capital and basis W in our space W. And we have this representation, the image of V1 is, um, can be represented as a sum of basic vectors from W. And so every image of every basis vector V is represented via basis vectors W. Then the matrix Again, we take these coordinates as column. This matrix is called the matrix of this linear mapping. Um, and there is one-to-one -one correspondence between linear mappings F and the matrices A. Uh, we will talk about the class of equivalent matrices in, in few in two slides. Uh, here, um, in one notion that I want to mention the rank, the rank of the mapping, the rank of linear mapping F is the same as the rank of the corresponding matrix A of this mapping. Or it's the same as the rank of the linear space over images of our basis V. And Thus, it's the same as dimension of image. So this is the definition of rank of linear mapping. Now, um, I didn't finish this slide. Um, I assume that V, A W is the same as V. Um, so in this case, 
the space of these linear mappings is denoted usually as L of V. And um, in this case, these linear mappings also are called linear operators. And what else? Yeah, another notion, and which means endomorphisms over V. And um, I didn't write all the definitions, but I think it's clear that this, this space of linear operators um, form the algebra. So it's um, commutative associative at the unit operator is just identity operator. And um, so we can um, talk about the algebra of linear operators. Now, um, in our spaces V and the second space also V, we can introduce different bases like E and E prime. Um, the question is how the matrix of our operator will be changed um, if we change the basis. And the answer is given by the formula seven that in new basis, A prime is um, the transform matrix inverse times the matrix of operator in the old basis times the transform matrix. In general, um, two matrices um, which are linked by this um, equality are said to be similar. So we say that matrix A prime is similar to matrix A. And now it uh, should be clear that for each linear operator, we have a class of similar matrices, matrices because they have they can have just different representation in different bases. And it's, we will use this um, equivalence, I think, till the end of this presentation, because of course, uh, it's easier to work with the simplest matrix like diagonal matrix or triangular matrix. And uh, we will try to find bases in our spaces to make simpler um, the matrix of linear operator. Some useful uh, notions. So the determinant of operator and trace of operator. Uh, this two, uh, in, in this slide, I want to show that these two no, uh, notions don't, do not depend on the basis. Okay, let's look at the determinant first. So by definition, determinant of linear operator is the same as determinant of his metric, of, of its matrix in whatever basis. And now um, 
we can just use the transformation matrix to um, to, to transform it to, to a different basis, and by the property of the of determinant determinant of product is the product of determinants. So determinant of B and B inverse are reciprocal. They will cancel each other. And so formula H shows that determinant of the linear operator doesn't depend on the basis. Trace. Trace of operator by definition is the trace of, the, of its matrix. And again, because it, the, the, it will not depend on the basis. So we don't say in which basis, just matrix A. Let's multiply by a unit um, identity matrix B times B inverse. Then by the property of the, of the trace, we can um, like, um, flip the first matrix and two others. And what we have, we have again, the expression for uh, matrix A, but in a new basis. So this formula also shows that definition of trace doesn't depend on the basis. Um, Well, uh, here is just notation I wanted to, to introduce automorphism of V are the invertible um, transformations, invertible operators. And they correspond to the group of invertible matrices, which makes sense, matrices with non-zero determinant. And uh, trace has a very useful property, linearity. The trace of linear combination is um, the sum of traces. And we will use it um, in uh, the very important uh, Hutchinson decomposition. Well, also everybody um, heard about eigenvectors and eigenfunctions and uh, eigenvalues, sorry. So let's um, introduce the definitions here. So let's first uh, introduce the definition of invariant subspace. So subspace U of our linear space V is said to be invariant with respect to a linear trans operator A. Um, so I want to say that from now we're using in mostly linear operations, operators. So mappings from V to V and the corresponding matrices will be the spared the matrices. So uh, the subspace U is invariant. If under the um, mapping by our operator A, it remains in U. So one dimensional invariance subspace uh, is a special case. So a non-zero vector from a one dimensional invariant subspace of operator A is called an eigenvector of this operator. And because 
um, it lies in one dimensional subspace. We can write this as formula 10, uh, a x equals just constant, which is um, the element of our field under consideration times x. So this is one dimensional subspace. And this constant lambda is called the eigenvalue of the operator A corresponding to the eigenvector X. By uh, definition, A X minus lambda X is zero. And uh, also there is condition that X is not zero vector here. When it uh, can happen, it can happen only uh, if X um, is an element of kernel. So the kernel uh, shouldn't be empty. Um, this I think it's better to write here uh, empty space. That means that the operator a minus lambda e, where e is, I should use i identity matrix because later I will use I for matrices. Uh, so E here is the identity matrix. Uh, that means that operator A minus lambda E or I is the generated, generated, sorry for misprints. I just finished today this slide. And this means that the determinant of this corresponding matrix is zero. The, this formula, this equation 13, is called characteristic equation. Two more not notions, geometric and algebraic multiplicity of eigenvalues. Um, consider the subspace V lambda, where lambda is a given eigenvalue. So this is a space of all eigenvectors corresponding to this eigenvalue, including a zero vector. Otherwise, it's not such space. Um, then the dimension of this subspace is called geometric multiplicity of the eigenvalue lambda. Um, and if we will look at the characteristic equation, then lambda will be the root of this equation. And the algebraic multiplicity of lambda is equal to the multiplicity of this lambda as the root of characteristic polynomial. Um, the set of all eigenvalues with their geometric multiplicities is denoted by spectrum of the operator A. If the geometric multiplicity is equal to one, then mm, the, this eigenvalue is set to be simple. But there is a well-known theorem that if a linear operator A 
of the n-dimensional space uh, has only simple spectrum. That means it has simple eigenvalues that it can be diagonalized. The other theorem, more general, um, gives the condition of diagonalization. So two conditions should be satisfied. First, that all characteristic roots should be from the field K. For example, if we work with real now matrices, the eigenvalues could be complex. So they should be real in this case. And the second condition that geometric multiplicity of each eigenvalue should be equal to its algebraic multiplicity. In this case, the, the, there is basis where the matrix of operator A is diagonal. Well, two, species, two, two more <laughs> definitions. Um, positive matrix and orthogonal matrix. So uh, now the matrices are square matrices, as I mentioned before. And a symmetric real matrix M. We could give definition for complex uh, matrix, but um, usually we use real matrices in uh, machine learning tasks. So I, um, I will talk from now just about real elements. So a symmetric uh, real matrix M is uh, positive define it if this scalar this number is positive for every non-zero vector v <clears throat> and um, Let's uh, talk about orthogonal matrix. So if two bases E and E prime are orthonormal, then as I mentioned before, the transformation matrix um, its inverse will be just a transposed matrix. Why? Because it will consist of Orthonormal vectors. Orthonormal vectors means that if we take the cone of the matrix, the norm of this cone will be one. So, um, a real square matrix Q, um, whose cones and rows are orthonormal vectors is called orthogonal matrix. The property, the necessary and sufficient condition of matrix to be orthogonal is the following. The product of Q transposed by Q gives the identity matrix. In other words, Q transposed is inverse. And now we, We'll use these definitions for ESVD decomposition. Um, so, very famous decomposition of matrix. Uh, any matrix, uh, not necessarily uh, squared, has the following decomposition u sigma v transposed, where u and v are orthogonal matrices. And sigma is a matrix um, of the same dimensions A, 
just with non-zero di diagonal elements, sigma one one, sigma two two, and so on. And these elements sigma are called singular values, singular values of the matrix. Um, if we write the matrix A transpose times A, um, then its eigenvalues will coincide with squares with this singular value squared. Example of using this um, singular value decomposition. Well, not obviously, it's not obvious now how it's related, but uh, it is. Uh, the whitening of data. We can preprocess our data, subtract mean, divide by variance, oh, sorry, so the, so the, by the standard deviation. But this is example A, our data B, uh, the normalizing of data. But you see that um, it just scales the picture. Um, if we want to decorrelate our data, then um, one can use whitening, so called. So let's um, use here a little bit a different notation. So sigma in my previous um, definition was um, the same as here D, but sigma here is the covariance matrix, just because it's the common notation. So um, I think everybody knows that the product of matrix by its transposed is a symmetric matrix and uh, so it can be diagonalized. We can represent this as diagonal matrix D in new basis. And um, if we then introduce new matrix W, PCA means principal component analysis. ZCA will mean um, uh, zero phase independent component analysis. So um, if we introduce this matrix W as follows as the square root of D and the square root of D will be the same matrix from the SVD decomposition. Um, and make this uh, change of variables, y is equal to w times x, then the new covariance matrix will be diagonal. And you can see the result on the picture ABC. And if we use a little bit different um, whitening matrix, um, you will see the result of the picture D. The difference between these two approaches is that you can see number two was shifted, was rotated by the first approach, but it remained on the same side um, under the second um, transformation. Norms, norms of matrices. Well, 
the norm of matrix is um, given by axioms. So here are four axioms for the, which any norm of matrix should satisfy. But if there are additional um, um, uh, relations, <laughs> for example, each element should be smaller than norm, or if each element of one matrix is smaller than each element of another matrix, then the norm of the first matrix is smaller than the second, then this norm is called canonical norm. Norm A of matrix A is said to be coordinated if the following inequality is satisfied. So the norm of AX smaller than the norm of matrix times the norm of X. And it is said subordinated if the inequality can be um, made as equality. So uh, here are three examples of standard norms, uh, L1, L2, and L infinite. The next line shows uh, corresponding subordinated norms. Um, a row here is the spectral radius. Spectral radius is the maximum singular value. You remember we introduced singular values before uh, of this matrix. Um, yes, here will be single. Si Single maximum singular value squared, and we take the squared. There is also, I think, the most uh, used Frobenius norm, just <clears throat> the square root of the sum of squares, which is coordinated with norm L2. And there is another norm n times the maximum value of the matrix, which is coordinated with all the previous norms. Okay, very important in my opinion application is Hutchinson trace estimator, which is used for estimation of, um, how do we call this uh, matrix of the second derivatives? Um, of the Hessian, of the Hessian. Uh, for example, for large dimensions, which is the case in, machine, in uh, deep learning. Um, <clears throat> so the idea here is to estimate trace of the matrix using just the vectors, the multiplication of A times V, where V are vectors, so-called Redemacher random variables. They consist only of positive or negative ones. Um, in this case, the expectation of the symmetric is just one. It's easy to check. And Hutchins, Hutchinson estimator is given by this formula. Um, so V transpose times A V. And it, the next line shows that this estimator is unbiased. And um, in practice, people are using um, the averaging. So they sample several vectors V and then uh, use the average. Uh, why it's important? 
it's important because singular values squared, you remember, are um, um, the eigenvalues of this matrix, A transpose times A. But the trace doesn't depend on the basis. And so this is, um, this will be the same as the square this the, as the Frobenius norm squared so in deep learning usually this Hutchinson trace estimator is used to estimate the norm of um, well this um, Hessian matrix um, well, I will skip this just useful um, formulas, uh, the matrix notation for linear regression. So in coordinate forms, it's a lot of matrices, but in matrix form is just Y minus X W transpose times uh, Y minus X W. Uh, if you don't find, I, I have probably, because the time is over, but I have probably uh, three slides left. So um, if you don't mind, I will um, use five more minutes and finish it. So <clears throat> very important. Um, uh, relationships for inverse matrices. The first theorem um, about inverse partitioned matrix, when we have matrices inside the matrix. And um, this theorem is used for um, derivation of the conditional normal distribution formula. And another very useful um, identity is Woodbury identity, which also um, helps us to calculate the inverse of this special matrix A plus something. A could be just identity, and then. Um, it simplifies a lot the calculation because it will um, reduce the dimension. And then it's easy to, to find the inverse. Well, I will skip other decompositions, which are useful for solution of linear systems, for example, or for finding the determinant of matrix. Uh, you will hear a lot about Halecki decomposition if you're working with, um, SciPy package. Um, Halesky decomposition is used, for example, for sampling from the normal distribution. Uh, if we can sample from the standard distribution. So it's just the representation of matrix, uh, squared matrix, positive defined matrix A which is the case usually for the um, covariance matrix in normal distribution as the product of um, lower triangular matrices L. Okay, 
uh, here is the last slide, the application of matrix calculus. You remember this estimator for um, sum of squared errors uh, for linear regression. So if we want to mi minimize it, we can just take the derivative of this with respect to vector w. I just want to say that um, this, this is the scalar, this is the number. If we want to find the derivative of the number with respect to vector, which is in this case, the weights of um, our linear regression, then the result also will be a vector. If we want to take the derivative with respect to matrix of the scalar, then the result will be matrix. If we want to take the derivative of, not of a scalar, but of a vector with respect to a scalar, it will be vector. But if we take the derivative of the vector with respect to another vector, the result will be a matrix and so on. Okay, it's, um, I think I, I should stop. I was using this textbook and um, also in our Facebook. Second, probably I can share just um, some something. Ah, yes, I want, wanted also just to mention the singular value decomposition in the example with um, example with uh, this image. So just, it's nice to understand it. So we have the image of rank 200. Then we can use in the singular SVD decomposition, uh, just um, smaller number of corresponding eigenvectors, for example, two, five, or 20. And um, you can see that image, we can uh, recognize the image even for 20 uh, first singular values. Um, which can just reduce the number of features. Okay, I think that's it for this chapter. Okay, well, thank you very much, Anton. That was great. Um, uh, if anybody has any questions for Anton, now would be, you can unmute your microphones and, um, and ask away. So the last example you showed, Anton, um, <clears throat> with the uh, single value decomposition of the rank 200 matrix, yes. this is why things like PCA work, right? Yes, I'm sure. <laughs> I think, yeah, of, of course, we, in PCA, we just use first um, larger the greatest singular values, yes. Yeah, because I was surprised in rank 20 that we could still see the image pretty clearly. <laughs> yes, yeah. I, I, uh, I think, um, you know, now the, the, I think from 2019, very famous, very, very popular diffusion denoising models. And they used the um, intuition behind these models was exactly this, that um, large dimensional data as images lives in the smaller dimensions. And they 
uh, in this denoising diffusion. Well, it was score matching first paper, um, but it's uh, like correlated to the noise in diffusion. They uh, used their Langevin sam dynamic sampling, um, decreasing the size of um, of the noise because they added noise, and this was the motivation for uh, this approach that um, the high dimensional data in fact can be represented in much smaller dimensions so they would wanted to find this how to say manifold which is a lower lower dimensional mm -hmm. okay Okay, well, thank you very much for the presentation, Anton. Um, I guess we're gonna wrap it up if there are no other questions. And um, we'll see you here uh, next week at the same time. For the same uh, presenter. Same presenter <laughs> on optimization, I believe. <laughs> All right, have a, good, have a good day or night, everybody. Bye-bye. And have a good, nice Christmas, bye. <laughs> yes, bye.